If everybody could take their seat, I'll call the uh, November 29th, 2018 meeting of the Finance Committee to order. If I can um, have everybody's attention. Okay. Um, so there, there is an agenda that's been circulated and unfortunately uh, we neglected to put in the meeting with the auditor as the first item on the agenda. So the agenda is on the screen and it simply states budget deliberations. But um, so uh, I will move that we accept that agenda as amended to include meeting with the auditor at the outset. Those in favor? Post, so it's carried unanimously. And then we'll go to the minutes of uh, last Tuesday's, or on Tuesday's meeting. And there were a number of motions in and out that were made. Did uh, the Finance Committee have an opportunity to review these? Or would you like us to slow down so we can get to them? So under the budget deliberations, we had a first motion by Mayor Borrowman uh, to unfund the $150,000 sprinkler protection unit. Unfund. To add the unfunded. To add the unfunded project. Sorry. Sorry. My uh, Your wish. Error. Right? Yeah. Change. And that was carried. And then the next motion uh, was moved by Councillor Comfort to remove the Rocktopia wall replacement. That was defeated. Um, Defer the refurbishment of the Zamboni uh, until future year was defeated. Uh, replace the energy return unit. Defer the replacement of the energy return unit was defeated. One, one for three, I'm not doing well. <laughs> uh, and then uh, moved by Councillor Seely to unfund the CRC air conditioning unit in the main floor gym, and that was carried as was the next one, which was to unfund the CRC scoreboard replacement um, with some discussion around trying to get um, users to fundraise for those two projects. So both those were carried. Um, and then there was uh, much discussion around the Fortis franchise fees and reallocating $460,000 of those franchise fees from the capital budget to the operating budget and then directing administration to come back. So that, um, that carried at $460,000, uh, moving 460 into the operating budget and with the intent to reduce the 2019 proposed tax increase to 4.6% and that carried. So did all those look correct? Yeah. All right, then I'll move that the minutes be approved as presented. Oh, sorry, yes, the ACA, the Alberta Conservation Authority land transfer was uh, removed from the budget and that carried unanimously as well. Okay, so I will move that those minutes be accepted as presented. Those in favor? Great, it's carried unanimously. Uh, we'll then move to the, the meeting with the auditor and I'll call up uh, Calvin Scott from Avail LLP and uh, he'll give you an overview of the audit process. Thank you for having me. There's nothing on screen so you're forced to look at me instead of anything up there. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a brief overview. I know. I, my face causes people to laugh. <laughs> Uh, I'll give you a brief overview of the audit process. Um, it's brief. We do a, a lot. It's a lot of time. We're here. The audit process actually starts next week. We'll have some people out here um, bugging your management staff um, going through a lot of the testing. So the audit itself, we come through and we assess the risks within your entity and we try to focus on those risks. So at the start of the audit, we provide you with an entity level control document, the IT level control document. So we're, we have all of the controls within your organization documented. Your management will review these, they'll update it for any changes to those controls. Um, we come in and look at those controls and ensure that they're functioning correctly. So we'll come out next week and we start doing test transactions to make sure that payroll, the revenue streams, um, credit cards, EFTs that are going through, that the controls in place are adequate to prevent um, material misstatement. Um, we go through and make sure there's no errors happening within there. And once we conclude that we can rely on those controls, um, we can move forward 
in following the rest of the audit. So we're trying to do it on a, on a sample basis. The audit's not coming in doing a forensic audit. We don't look at 100% of the transactions. We come in and we look at a test basis. We make sure the controls are working properly and we rely on those controls so we can do an effective audit. Yes? I have a question about <coughs> the quantity that would be represented by material misstatement. How much? So Does generally, materiality for, the, um, for your town is about 1.6 million. And so when we come in, so there would be an aggregate of transactions that would add up to 1.6 million. If that were the case, um, we would be suggesting we make those entries. So that's the materiality level, which is generally around 3% of revenues that we say, if the statements were misstated by that amount, it wouldn't affect the users of the financial statements. That's a significant amount, however. If it got anywhere close to that number, we would be making adjustments prior to that, and we would be suggesting that management make those, um, actually make those entries to fix the financial statements. Okay, so that would be a, a real red flag, a really <coughs> obvious red flag for you. Absolutely, and that would be the, the sum of all of the differences. Generally, we'd be looking at when we're, we're looking at transactions, it's going to be at one-fifth and maybe a tenth, depending on the assessed risk of that area. So we would go through the, the entity in itself, and we would assess the higher risk areas. So um, areas for your municipality would be something like the TCA transactions. There's a lot of them going through. There's a lot of... Um, there's an abundance of dollars and there's a lot of transactions that are going through and we want to make sure that they're capitalized or expensed properly in line with your policies. So that would be a higher risk area. Uh, in many municipalities, deferred revenue would be a risk area because there's a lot of grants that are coming in. Uh, we need to know that that revenue is being recognized properly against the expenses and in the current period. So we spend a lot of time um, within your organization looking at those things to make sure the revenues are being recognized, the expenses are being recognized correctly. Um, cut off of accounts payable and receivable, making sure that all the correct grants are recorded uh, would be another risk area that we look at and spend more time. So in those risk areas, we would lower our materiality level and look at numbers that are a lot lower. As compared to lesser risk areas, we would, we would do less work in those areas. So the higher the risk, the less the materiality. Uh, no, the materiality stays the same, but the scope of what we're looking at would go in there. So we would adjust the performance materiality, we'll say it, and we look at a lower level. Okay, great. Thank you. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, I know you've been doing our, our audits for quite a few years now. Yeah. And so you come to our municipality and you do the processes. We have upgraded a number of our systems. Yes. Uh, to be more, um, less manual and more digital. Yes. Do you do any kind of evaluation on, on the robustness or the... Yes, so every year we're going through that, those controls are going to be documented for us. Those systems get documented by management, and then we come through and do walkthroughs on those systems. So anytime there's a change, we do random walkthroughs or a rotating walkthrough on all of the systems. So on all of the revenue cycles, the expense cycles, payroll, uh, we do that on an annual basis and we rotate through. And anytime there's a change, we ensure to go through that system specifically to make sure that the controls are functioning correctly. So we will have it documented and we will test that system as soon as it changes. Okay, great. So, I mean, we do a lot of those changes, right? So Absolutely. It's good to obviously monitor So, and that. that's our, one of our main focuses, to make sure we can rely on those controls. Because if we can't, it results in a lot more work for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And should we find weaknesses in those controls, we'll be telling you uh, through the management letter and while we're doing the audit as well. Uh, other parts of the process that we do would be ensuring that we're independent. So we have independence letters that come to you. Um, to make sure that we're not gaining financially um, through anything that we're doing. We're not related to you. There's no transactions where we can benefit um, through the work that we're doing um, other than our agreed upon engagement. Um, and that's done annually with you as well um, and reassured. Um, we also have a fraud discussion. So subsequent to this, we'll, um, and at a different point in time, we'll be asking both management and the audit committee and or council whether you have any concerns of fraud, whether you're aware of any fraud. Um, and if there's any areas that you want us to look at specifically that you have concerns. Um, and then subsequent to the audit, if, should we find any, any um, significant issues, the audit committee will be made aware of that at that point in time. You will not find out at a meeting later on in time and be surprised by it. You will be alerted to it. Um, we would address it with you should we find any major findings, which we have not in the term of our relationship so far. Uh, yes, I just had a question, but uh, I was, maybe you were going get to get to capital. So um, in our capital budget, uh, we 
carry projects forward from year to year. We call them work in progress yes. uh, projects. Um, and we, you know, we, we have policies, internal policies about when a project can be carried forward and uh, when it can't. But um, do you have best practices or do you have any concerns with sort of our ability to close out capital projects or how many, do, do you look at that from a, um, uh, an audit perspective at all? When we look at it from an audit perspective, we want to make sure that that asset, depending on what it is, is in use. And at that point in time is when we say we should start to amortize that asset. Okay. So when that the project is done, if there's $12 left on it, but it's actually being in its in use asset, then we would suggest that it would be a capitalized and it should be amortized at that point in time. Up until then, it would remain in work in progress. So just a question that came up this morning, for example, was around some of our flood mitigation projects that, uh, you know, we've done a number of the hazard and risk assessments on them and we've applied for grants. So we've, we've had funding allocated for them, but we're, we're awaiting the grants. So um, theoretically, the project hasn't started yet, but we have it on the books. Is, yes. that, is that of concern to you? Uh, no, because that would no. just be, I would consider that work in progress myself. Work in progress. Yeah. Okay, which is what we decided this morning. Because yeah. um, there is always a chance that that project is not going to go forward, and then at that point in time, we'd probably be expensing that cost right. Right. as opposed to capitalizing because it's not providing a future benefit. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it has to meet the capital threshold, of course, yeah. And then uh, you, you mentioned, um, uh, I forget what, what you called it, but anyways, we have a lot of grant revenue that we've received in advance and we're waiting yes. for the, the balance of it. Um, so that's, uh, we're, the way we're managing that is to, to keep it in investments, short-term investments, and to put um, all our interest back into that project. And so you're monitoring that whole process. Absolutely. So we go through all of the grants and ensure that the reporting has been done correctly, that the interest is being deferred accordingly to the agreement. To the agreement with the province or the federal yes. government. Okay. And then if it's unspent, that it's actually showing as unspent and recorded in deferred revenue. The okay. offset can be in cash or investments, whatever that might be. Okay. But we're ensuring that it's recognized at the proper time. Okay. So there aren't any concerns that you have in how we're managing that capital no, program? Not at all. Thank you. We haven't had any issues with it in the past, and yeah. I don't expect any in the future. Great. Okay, are there any uh, other uh, questions for Calvin? We will um, allow council or the finance committee uh, the opportunity to go in camera and have a direct conversation just between yourselves and uh, the auditor. So we can do that. Um, can I ask one more question? Yes, absolutely, Councillor Sanford. You mentioned that you are monitoring our grant funding. Do you also review our reserve accounts? How so? Reserve account balances. Oh, to, we yeah. Do, yeah, we reserve, uh, review the reserves on an annual basis to yeah. ensure that that money can be transferred in that. Okay. So you, you, you're... It would be another normal risk area, so yeah. there has to be... Uh, council has to approve the transfer to be able to mm -hmm. go into there, so oftentimes the... Oftentimes errors we see, not that we've seen it here, but there are transfers that happen without approval or it is money that shouldn't be moved in there. Right. Um, so sometimes we see that there's confusion between what's deferred revenue, what's externally restricted and what's internally restricted. Mm -hmm. So we try to ensure, or we do ensure, that all of the funds that are being transferred are internally restricted funds and not externally. So when we talk about grants that are unspent, those need to be shown as deferred revenue as opposed to moved into a reserve account for later right. spending. Okay. So yes, Great. we monitor that on an annual basis as well. Okay, thank you. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any uh, so yes, Councillor? It's not anything really to do with the audit, but Calvin, can you just remind uh, me how many other municipalities uh, avail uh, audits? We currently do 22 other. Well, I guess 21 other municipalities. All, all in this general region. Uh, within Southern Alberta, yes. Right. If this is considered Southern Upper, anything south of here, I suppose. <laughs> there are a couple actually a little further north than this, but yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, then I'll move that the Finance Committee go in camera. Those in favor? Okay. And we'll just turn off the mics. And, and Calvin, you're welcome to come sit at the table with uh, the Finance Committee, and the rest of us will.
Uh, Thank you very much. Tab, tab, uh, tab five. So it kind of replaces your other big sheets there in tab five. Big sheets. I mean, if you want to keep it for record, I'm sure you have notes on it. There probably will be another one by the Okay, welcome back. Um, before we get into my presentation, and I, has everybody got a copy of it? Great. Um, we ended up delaying the um, start of this meeting till 10 this morning to accommodate the auditor and also uh, the mayor who is opening a conference, uh, the Mountain Town Planners Conference this morning. So we arbitrarily set the end time till one o'clock but I just want to make sure that people are available to one so we can manage the time. Is everybody able to stay till one? Yes, but, not later. but not later. Okay, so, um, and maybe we won't need all of that time. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, uh, based on the direction that uh, the Finance Committee gave administration on Tuesday, we have spent the last day and a half um, as a corporate strategic team working through how to bring you back some uh, recommendations for your consideration to uh, amend the budget. So I'm gonna go through a presentation. I think it's probably best if I, I mean, if there's questions for clarification, that would be good, but they, it's sort of an iterative showing you our thought process and maybe I'll ask that you um, let us go through our thought process and then we can pause and answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so first I wanna start where we began and, and review um, why we brought you the budget we brought you. Uh, and I think we had some good discussion about this on Tuesday, but it's, it's, you know, essentially our uh, administrative model has reached the end of its current uh, capacity. Uh, it's based on significant growth that we've seen over the last uh, decade or so. The addition of Elevation Place, Arts Place, Gymnastics Center, our affordable housing program growth, bringing on both regional and local transit, flood mitigation, responding to the flood as well as the entire flood mitigation program, seniors housing, uh, the pedestrian and cycle infrastructure we've added, uh, and the asset management program. And I know I'm leaving out a bunch of, of stuff. Um, but, but that gives you a sense of the growth we've had and why potentially our, our corporate services division um, in particular hasn't kept up to that pace of growth. You know, we added recreation center staff, uh, but you know, we didn't add HR staff and IT staff to the same uh, capacity. So the budget that we brought you with the 6.6% initial increase in uh, 2019 uh, and a quite a bit lower increase, sorry, I'll bring up the next little um, portion. This was the uh, tax increase without growth, so the net new tax increase and what it would mean for uh, a potential tax um, hit uh, to residents in town was 6.6% in 2019 and 3% in 2020. And then we'd have another bump up in 2021 and 2022. Um, but based on the, um, sorry, and then the tax supported full-time positions that we shared with you, and this was in uh, Therese Rogers' initial presentation uh, on day one, so you can go back and look at the, the full slide of this, but these were the full-time position requests, and the majority of these were asked for by managers based on existing demand and resource needs today. 2019 and 2020, but in order to, to manage the budget and make it a reasonable tax increase, we pushed a significant number of positions out to 2021 and 2022. So I just want you to, um, to be aware of that because we'll come back and talk more about that. So we already went through these motions when you approved your minutes this morning, but again, as a remainder, the motions made on Tuesday were a series to the capital budget uh, to put um, the one project in the fund, uh, the sprinkler protection unit, and then take a series of projects out. But the result of all of those motions was an increase to the capital budget of $37,000. OK, 
okay? <laughs> uh, and then you gave us that uh, direction to reallocate $460,000 of the Fortis franchise fees and to keep the balance of, of that revenue, 600,000 or so in the, the capital fund to, to fund capital projects with the intended result to reduce the 2019 tax increase to 4.6%. And you asked us to bring you back a new capital plan that would fit in with the new uh, capital funding envelope. And we're gonna go through that plan in detail. But so what that would look like based on this iterative uh, chart is, okay, so what if we reduced um, or brought in revenue from Fortis franchise fees of $460,000 every year in your plan? And uh, this would be the resultant tax increase. So yes, in year one, you would reduce your tax increase to 4.6%. However, in 2020, that would go down to 3%. It would go back up because we had all those position request asks in 2021. It would go back up to 6% in 2021 and at 4.7% in 2022. So um, since that time, and I, we have had some new information come to light. And quite literally, as the CST, we were sitting in the boardroom uh, looking at how to, to make these adjustments and Sally Cottle received a couple of emails. So the first email was from our manager of recreation who, as you know, was seconded um, to the Olympic um, bid, uh, BIDCO and has just come back and is now working full time back in recreation. So the first thing he did as a recreation manager is review the budget that, that his team presented. Plus he's got up to date, year to date actuals that when the budget was prepared, they didn't have. They had uh, year-to-date actuals as of July, and now we have year-to-date actuals as of October. And our membership revenue is, is trending quite high. We're $160,000 uh, higher than budget year-to-date today. And uh, we, we believe with the trends, and so we, we had increased revenue slightly for 2019 and 2020, but based on Jim Yonker's evaluation and looking at the trend and our year-to-date actuals, we believe we can bring in $100,000 of additional recreation revenue from sale of memberships in 2019, and actually that could increase to $200,000 in 2020 and the years beyond. So we talked about this as a, a corporate strategic team these aren't guaranteed revenues, right? It's based on um, uh, membership sales. And we typically always budget conservatively on revenues that aren't guaranteed uh, because you just never know. But then what we likely see is a surplus next year um, as a result of higher than uh, planned fees coming in. So we talked about whether we just don't bring this to the finance committee's attention and we monitor and we report it as a surplus next year or we bring it to your attention to help with the budget deliberations. So we felt we should bring it to your attention. And um, the second email that Sally received as we were sitting there was from our manager of protective services who had been on vacation for the last couple of weeks and he came back to review um, what had um, occurred and if you recall back to the position request slide, there was a position request for a peace officer. And that position request was initially uh, proposed for 2019. And as the CST, we had deliberated and we couldn't afford to do all the positions in 2019. So we had pushed that peace officer request out to 2021. And there were some resultant revenue that we pushed out as well because if you don't have a peace officer, you weren't, you're not gonna increase your revenue. And we made an error and we pushed out too much revenue and he, he discovered that error. So um, based on existing revenues, existing peace officer complement, the fine revenue in bylaw services should be $30,000 higher every year than we have actually budgeted. So these, this is good news, it's revenue, it's not expenditures. Uh, we debated again with this one because fine revenue, you know, we could lose a peace officer next year to attrition or, or whatever, and then the revenue drops. Uh, but again, similar to the um, membership fee revenue, we thought it's best for the finance committee to, to make this decision of whether you want to um, acknowledge this revenue and give us direction to amend the budget to bring it in. So um, we'll show you a series of amendments if you want to do that. 
Um, so if we now look at this slide, this iterative slide of, of the what if changes, we still had the $460,000 Fortis fee direction from the Finance Committee, but we now have two new revenue sources. And if we did everything, um, brought in those revenue sources, made the um, Fortis fee adjustments as already directed, this would be the resultant increase in tax. So 2019 would drop to a 4% increase, 2020 would go below 3 what we'd come back up because of the, that bulk of positions in 2021 and 2022. Um, so administration felt that really the intent, and if you go back to that emotion that you approved as the Finance Committee on Tuesday, the intent of your motion with the Fortis fees was to reduce the tax hit in 2019 to 4.6. So with these revenues, bringing it down to uh, 4% was really not the intention of the Finance Committee. So if we adjust that Fortis fee line, and it's in that orange bar there, the orange row, from the 460 to 330,000 in 2019, 230 in all the other years, then this is what your resultant tax increase would look like, 4.6% in 2019, but you still have that um, 3% and then that bump up in 2021. So when you, I, we'd like to look at this line and um, question the Finance Committee as to whether or not that was your intent to have a 3% increase in 2020. Uh, because now the overall, you know, the, when administration brought in the 6.6% and 3%, we did that to try to average the two years to make them 5% per year. Now that average is 3.9% per year. And um, just a reminder that inflation alone is trending at 3%, right? So we, we talked at the outset as we, we don't continually want to do ourselves a disservice and, um, and not give us ourselves the resources to deliver on the services and programs we need. So there is one other consideration administration would like the Finance Committee to uh, look at. And that is these bulk of positions in 2021. As I mentioned, they were initially proposed by management uh, in 2019 or 2020. And we moved them out in order to smooth out that increase. If we moved those positions from 2021, those four positions that total 383,000 to 2020, you end up with a smoothing out of that increase to approximately 4.6% per year. 4.6, 4.6, 4.5, 4.7. Um, and so this is the administration recommendation that we would like you to consider. I wanna put up one more slide and then I'd like to open it up to discussion and, and question. So um, going back to this, slide, sorry, the one before, out in 2022, there's an executive office admin assistant position for $80,000. And as an option B, we would like the Finance Committee to, to think about whether or not you'd have interest in moving that support up to 2019. And I know that's a big jump, that's sort of moving it four years ahead. Um, but as we considered that, and, and certainly I, I know we've had this discussion before because the executive admin assistant position supports council and the mayor and senior admin. We had a, pos a, per a person in that position up until 2010. And then through attrition, that, that person left and we were in a tough budget year then. And so uh, we didn't rehire for that position. And we have uh, been with one executive admin assistant for all of the people in this room, uh, with the exception of, of Rick in finance, but everybody else uh, be, being supported by, by one admin assistant. And uh, as we start to look at the needed Im improvements and efficiency and uh, what the organizational review is saying, we would like you to consider moving that position up. So there's another line item in this slide 
Because we're moving it all the way from 2022 to 2019, you would see a new addition of 80,000 in each of those three years. But this would, would be the impact of 4.9% in 2019, 4.6 in 2020, 4.5 in 2021, and 4.4 in 2022. 4.9 over the first two years. Uh, would that, is that right? 4.9 because it's compounded. So you'd still be under your 5% in the two years, which is what you're approving. You're going to approve the first two years and you're, well, you'll be asked to approve the four-year plan. So 2021 and 2022, um, you'll see a, a full detailed budget of those in the fall of 2020. In the fall of 2019, we would bring you back probably some uh, small amendments to the budget for 2020, just like we did for, for this year's budget. So I know that's a lot to absorb. Uh, there was a lot, there's a sort of an iterative step. Hopefully uh, you saw it as, as uh, logical and, and you could understand our thought process, but we'd like to pause there uh, before we get into motions and discussion on organics. Uh, to, to see where the Finance Committee's thinking is. Mayor Borwin? Uh, thanks very much for uh, both the work that's been done and, and uh, the overview. Um, quite a different conversation than, or different information than we had before us a couple of days ago, so very interesting. Um, just speaking to the, uh, the last item, the moving the exec assistant position forward, uh, I've, I've thought since the first iteration of the budget that um, that it, it may, may be cutting off our nose despite our face by leaving that position funded quite a ways out. As Lisa mentioned, there's one person that's providing assistance for everybody, uh, including, you know, so now there's uh, an increased um, senior admin pool and myself and council. Uh, and, and in the context of what we've learned through the uh, organizational review consultation and, and our decision to, uh, with intent, change how we provide services in the town of Canmore, it seems not well advised to leave only one person providing administrative support for all of those people, including myself. So I, I personally would support moving that forward to 2019, given the other changes that have uh, come about. In, in regards to um, the new information, the revised information from Rec Department with Jim back in his office, uh, We've certainly seen over the years since uh, Jim joined the town uh, and since Elevation Place opened that that facility particularly is very successful and Jim's proven to be a, an incredibly uh, competent manager of the rec department, rec services. And we've seen continually growing revenues uh, from that department ever since uh, it opened and uh, each year a surplus. So I'm have, I have 100% confidence in, in the information that, that Jim's brought to the table now that, that he feels uh, secure in suggesting that we could budget that $100,000 in 2019 and 200000 in 2020 as uh, future revenue. Every year for the last several years when it's come to the audit time and council sees uh, a uh, significant surplus, a uh, million dollars plus in surplus. I mean, we, we've managed to, uh, managed to, we've, we've, we've applied that surplus to some really critical areas, so not a bad thing. But over time, we should be trying to, to budget closer to the bone and not seeing uh, significant surpluses each year like that. Um, so I'm, I'm personally really uh, interested in the discussion that, that's being presented and uh, I, I would be comfortable with the changes suggested by admin. 
I particularly like the leveling out of the tax increase over the years. That 6% that was noted in 2021 was uh, concerning. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I'm really happy that this is the conversation today as a, you know, in contrast to what we were talking about the other day. And, and also the uh, resulting re reduction in the uh, draw out of the Fortis fees to support operating is a positive piece of information. And you, you didn't really touch on the, the long-term capital impact that, that... Yeah, so we just want to make sure that this concept okay. uh, is what the Finance Committee supports, and then we can go into the details of which projects we would recommend moving or deferring uh, or removing. Yeah, Councillor Sanford. Um, yeah, I think that's good rationale, and I, I like the fact of moving some of the staff up and also, also supporting that position. Um, I'm just wondering why those Fortis fees are separated the way they are, going directly into capital. Why wouldn't they come right through the budget and then we allocate how much goes into capital? Because it's sort of a shot in the dark as to what's going into capital. Um, and I think we have determined that we want to put more into capital through our budgeting process, but every year we, we don't quite reach our budget, but it's going into that capital from a different source. So I'm just really wondering mm -hmm. if those Fortis fees shouldn't be coming into the operating right. budget and then we allocate the capital. So th I think that's an excellent point. And we can look at that as, as a year-to-year -year yeah. basis. Uh, what we do is we try to plan. So um, there was a previous motion, council motion, to use those fees to support the debt payment for the power line burial. And, um, and that the balance of those fees go into the capital. Uh, so that's what we've been following. But those, sure. as we showed, uh, on Tuesday, I guess, those, those fees have been increasing and uh, now the debt payment ha is, we're down to the final debt payment in 2019. So if your direction is, you know, theoretically that's what happens. They come into yeah. operating and then they get transferred to capital, yeah. right? But they don't get transferred transparently because I think it's just, it, it's a flow through, but it's not it's it, Yes, council. you're right. It's in like the it's budget. It's coming in, but it's, it's going in and out on its right. own, and we don't really know what that number is, right? Because we're not managing that number? Uh, yes, and, and like I guess... The council's not managing that number. It's coming through the process, but it's not yeah. being directed. So the last time we had the discussion on franchise fees was when you increased them, mm -hmm. um, and that was a few years ago, and we brought bylaws, and we had a discussion at that time where those franchise fees go in your budget. Uh, and then in the long-term financial strategy, there's a direction that the Fortis fees go into capital. So that's, um, you know, it's a strategy. It's, I, I but it's certainly not a hear what you're saying. It's not, it's not a known amount, it's not a known quantity because it's just- Because it changes estimate. annually. Yeah, yep. th that's the point I wanted to make is yeah. that the difficulty with franchise fees, like I'll, pretty much all of our revenue lines or many of our revenue lines, um, it's a projection. So we get a projection from Fortis or from ADCO that indicates we expect your franchise fees in this year to be X amount. Um, but to, uh, it's more, so it makes sense in that sense to have it go to capital as um, a somewhat uncertain number. We know the debt payment is gonna come out and then the balance goes into capital. Um, if you bring it all into operating and you do it as a fixed number, you don't know whether or not that number will actually be the correct number or not. And then you're, you're left trying to do this delicate balancing of, um, well, how much of that number do we allocate then, given that it is uncertain? So there, there are some, even though it does actually come through operating and then into capital, there is some simplicity in continuing to assign franchise fees. Because at the end of the day, our favorite phrase, it's all fungible. Um, and if you don't fund it through the franchise fees, then the capital envelope has to be funded through other means. So I, I, Rick might have a different thought, but I'm just thinking from an accounting purpose, this is actually one of the simpler ways and more transparent ways to do it. And over the years, it has been the one of the one dedicated funding sources for capital, mm -hmm. or to build, to build the reserve to be spent. And I'm not again, saying underfund capital, I'm just no. saying that whatever that real number is, we know what that real number is, because if we don't know what the capital, mm -hmm. yeah. what is actually going into capital, because we don't know what but, but, will be. So, so the difference between, again, between capital and operating, 
in capital, for pretty much all of our capital lines, we have reserves, right? Mm -hmm. And so because of that, so we have the general capital reserve, we have the flood or the asset management mm -hmm. reserve. And so because of those reserves and we fund our projects, so the money goes into the reserves and then from the reserves, we fund projects. Because we have those reserves and we keep those reserves at healthy levels, we can, there's essentially a buffer there so that if the forwarders fees come in 50 or $100,000 less than anticipated, then there's still a healthy reserve there to balance that out and to be able to fund the projects. In operating, we don't, we, although we have an operating reserve, we don't use the operating reserve in that way. So it would be, it would be less, if you assigned a full amount, 1.1 million, because that's the projection in operating, and you don't get the 1.1 million, you have to find another way to, to fund whatever it was that you were funding from that 1.1 million. Yeah. And, that I, and I, yeah, I, I think uh, the, Main point, as I understand it, Councillor Sanford, is uh, you just want it to be transparent in the budget process, what, what we're budgeting for and, and how it's being allocated. And just how it's getting into the capital fund. How it's fund getting into the capital and, you know. fund, yeah. So we can report on that so that it's not just sort of a, you know, mixed in with the, the total revenue line, so that you see clearly what your franchise fees are every year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I like what I'm seeing here. I would still like to see um, the 430 in 2019 and a 4.6% So bringing more of the franchise fees yeah. in, yeah. And those in 2019, but then you're gonna drop them off in 2020, 2021. Right. Um, and so I know that will affect capital over time, but it's only $100,000, so, you know. Right, so the, we, the we can- The real effect of that is probably well, negative. We can, we can certainly talk about that. That's, that's one item, but, mm -hmm. uh, we, Mayor Borman, did you have something you wanted to add? Just, just to Councillor Sanford's point, I, I, I agree it would be nice to be able to see that flow through, but, but I, I would, it's important that uh, for future councils that it's, it's initially shown that it, it's going into capital. Yes, here's the number projected. It's going through operating, but it's going to capital because that's council direction. Rather than just putting it into operating and saying, okay, how much of that does the council want to transfer? Because you know where future councils will go with that. And then capital uh, reserves could become underfunded. So uh, I, I'm very supportive of how the money has been directed through this budget, but I, I agree uh, understanding that flow would be helpful. Okay. So we are proposing to pull 230, 400, 330, 230 out of capital, e, or out of the Fortis each year, not going to capital. Right. That's correct. And currently, 187,000 of that money is going to debt. Right. right. But, when, but is it 2019 is the last year? Yeah. So then after we retire that debt, now again, there's $187,000 more yeah. um, that's correct. redistributable. And, and that capital. funding that goes to operating essentially has to go into operating each year but mm -hmm. the potential is for increasing Fortis uh, uh, fees, which then would increase the amount of money going mm -hmm. through into capital. So we'll continue to increase that source of funding for capital through presumably increasing fees. But to Mike's point, who knows? Right, so and, and just on the fee question. So um, there's two ways the franchise fees increase or can increase. One is if Fortis or ACO themselves are collecting more fees rate, um, related to the T&D charges and then the, the commodity price. So if that increases, then we get a higher um, collection of fees. The other is that we can actually control, and, and Mr. Soto mentioned this the other day, that if we give notice to either ACO or Fortis, we can increase fees once per year, right? So we have to give notice before November 1st and then they can raise the fees. So ADCO fees are capped at a maximum of 35 percent uh, a year and we are currently at 28 so we have limited room to grow uh, in terms of what we can max out in terms of fee collection from uh, from ADCO at Fortis the maximum is 20 percent and we are currently at 10 so there's a little bit more room there um, the the one and only time I got to use my economics background at the town of Canmore is uh, on the question of fees so the, the challenge with fees is that um, because it's based on, to some extent, consumption, it's really related to the T&D charges, but it's also related to, to the consumption. Raising the fees actually disproportionately impacts the lower income groups within our community over the higher income groups in our community. So um, it may 
there's some convenience in addressing fees because people don't think of it as, like taxes. It's still a money that they're paying, but it's sort of separate from the whole tax discussion. So there's a convenience factor in, in raising fees, um, but it does disproportionately impact the, the lower income groups. So it is, if, you know, as a council priority of addressing affordability in the community, is not necessarily where administration would recommend looking to, um, to get increases. Right. And so that's different than the, the tax where it's based on the assessment, the assessed value of the, the home, how much you pay. So if you have a more expensive home, you, you pay a higher rate. Okay. Um, are there any other questions, comments, discussion points from, oh, sorry, Councillor yeah, uh, I just Comfort. have a question about, <clears throat> uh, I, this is a total increase without growth. It's all net new. Growth isn't considered. Correct. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we had a real jump in growth, how would that, is, is that going to be a marginal effect on this or would that have a substantial effect on this? Because sometimes things grow and you have attendant expenses. Right. So um, just to uh, rem remind uh, the committee, there, we have budgeted for $400,000 in new growth, and we think that that is realistic. It's not too conservative. Our finance manager before she left uh, sat down with our planning staff and looked at all of the development permits that are in process right now and who will be coming on to pay taxes in 2019 that hasn't paid taxes in 2018. And um, we looked at our supplemental assessments for the fall of 2018. So we're, we're pretty confident that that's a, a reasonable number. That being said, if we get more growth, uh, maybe I'll ask Rick to, <laughs> to respond to that. So if, if we get $500,000 as opposed to $400,000 in new growth, how do we account for that? It's the, the, the pie that's split among everybody else <laughs> so it would, uh, you and I, taxes would go down yeah. a couple of pennies. <laughs> but, but what because it, it doesn't increase our overall budget. That's right. Our overall budget is still the twenty four or five million dollars. There, there's there's more, more people to split the pie up too. More people to split too. the pie up a little bit. So. Yeah, so and, and, we'll reduce taxes and, a little and bit. And that was the experience in, with council in the early uh, uh, 2000s. No, whenever the sub mortgage prime, that was... 2008, 2010. Yeah. So prior yeah. to that, uh, when growth, or maybe it was in the 90s, when growth was really crazy, that allowed council to, to really minimize tax impact to, uh, in, in, to existing residents because council was able to fund all the increasing budget through new taxes. So and it was, then we got hammered. Yeah, but we did. But So, so that's the real effect. <laughs> if, if growth should start occurring again, and I'm not advocating for it, but at those rates, um, council can have very generous budgets without it having that big an impact on the existing taxpayers. Okay, Councillor McCallum, you had? Comments? I was just going to, you were looking for commentary yep. on the options. Um, I would agree with the mayor that uh, Mr. Yonker has always brought us responsible budgets and very responsible uh, projections, and so I have complete faith in whatever number he has provided for us. Uh, um, and uh, yay for 30 grand. Um, <laughs> yay. Uh, I do like the smoothing effect. I've always been a big fan of the smoothing effect. Um, I think that if we have more growth as uh, um, Councillor uh, Sanford is alluding to, Council should maybe consider putting that into our reserves um, because, uh, as we know, we're not putting the 5% towards our capital reserves um, in this budget as we have said that we want to. So we would probably want to consider that as an option should, um, should there be growth uh, beyond this uh, budget. And um, I like this. I just want to see what's been cut in the capital to accommodate it because it's not a complete picture in my mind. So, okay. so far, yeah. so good. Okay. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yes, Councillor Seeley? Yeah, I like the uh, new revenue sources and findings and uh, support administration's recommendations, including option B to add the uh, administration, uh, 
the admin assistant position in 2019. One of my amendments was going to be to uh, add the RCMP detachment uh, services assistant to 2020. So I'm glad uh, we've creatively been able to, to make that move. And I do like uh, the fire prevention officer and the community peace officer being moved to 2020 as well. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay, we can certainly, I'm just wondering if there's any other comments on Councillor Sanford's um, suggestion that the Fortis fees in 2019 um, be increased, uh, I guess it would be the $80,000 uh, to reduce that 4.9% down to 4.6. Um, Mayor Borman? So that's not a motion yet, but no. we talk about it. And, yeah. um, while at the last meeting I had arbitrarily picked the 4.6 as the target, um, at this point, I'm, I'm comfortable with uh, leaving it as suggested. Um, I really, to, to Councillor McCallum's point, I think it's important that we continue to be fairly aggressive or intentional in, in funding capital. Um, so the net result below five, which was Council's initial uh, direction and, and leveling it out over the next four years, uh, if there was a, an amending motion, I don't think I would support it, but you can always put it forward and see. Okay, any other comments or we can proceed to some of those uh, discussion items about capital? Bring on the capital. Okay. Oh, sorry, I never got to this. <laughs> but we can come back to this. Um, and this is actually of the recommended option, so not the option B. Um, I don't think it would materially change. Uh, so if you look at the, um, say the $600,000 household going from a $104 uh, tax increase per year, it'll go to 109. $5 a month. It would go up $5 a month. Cheap bottle. Cheap, very cheap bottle. <laughs> Nothing I would drink, I'll tell you that. That's a bottle of Chateau Get no, Down. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the Counts things I'd like to raise at this point, when we look at a chart like this, it seems pretty straightforward um, that this is what's going to be your impact. But what I'm hearing from people in communities is that their assessments are going so much higher than what they've been. So, you know, if you had a $600,000 household this month or this year, you might have an $850,000 household in two years and you've done nothing. Like everything shifts. So your costs go up incrementally with the assessed, assessment shift. And it's, you know, it, it seems really simple to look at it this way. And I, I'm, I'm, I like to look at it with the $100,000 um, increment. Yeah. But sometimes your assessment goes up with absolutely no impact from you improving your property. It's because your whole neighborhood has increased. And it does put an impact on the people in those neighborhoods. The, the difficulty with the, the conversation on assessment is that, um, well, one, there's an assumption that it will always go up, and that's not the case. So after 2008, there was a period of time where assessments came down in Canmore, and they came Quite down a bit. consistently for a number of years, and then it took us a number of years before we caught back up to the assessments that had been reached at the previous peak. So assessment, you know, the assessed value of a property is not linear, right? It's cyclical. Um, the other issue is that those are factors that we can't, as a municipality, control. It's related entirely to the market demand. So assessments in the long term are going to continue to go up in Canmore and probably at a higher rate to other communities in Alberta because Canmore is a very desirable place to live. And uh, although certainly people can become house poor by virtue of, you know, their, their, uh, the cost to maintain their house goes, goes up every year even though their incomes may not have changed, the challenge is that the value of their property has gone up substantially. So although they are to some extent house poor, they do have equity in the assets that they could tap into in other ways or they could make other choices. Um, but to essentially to, un to make the argument that we should reduce um, the requirements we need to manage the community and deliver the services because the value of people's houses is going up is going to put us in a, even more of a difficult position in the long run than, than we're currently in. So I understand what you're saying, Councillor Sanford, and it's a, it's a valid point. Assessments are going up, 
but it's due to factors we can't control, and part of it is linked to the desirability of this community, which is also related to the services that we provide. And, and uh, this is something I drone on about every year, but so um, assessments go up, perhaps, and our assessments are very high, but our mill rate is just yeah. about the lowest in the province. And every year when I go through this exercise, which I do post uh, budget approval, and do some comparisons on, on comparator communities in the region, uh, our tax, the actual dollars, the taxes that we individually pay on our homes is, is really, uh, uh, compares very favorably to other communities. And, and even when you do a, a comparison of, that factors in the, in the high uh, assessment on a, take a three bedroom home, uh, sort of a top end finished three bedroom home, in Canmore, that might be a million dollars. In Cochrane, it might be 700,000. I don't know. I mean, you compare on that rate, our taxes are almost exactly the same. So people uh, get hung up, I feel, on um, percentages rather than the actual uh, dollar impact and, and compared to tax uh, collection on in every other community. So. Yeah, I've started my next uh, year's rent. But we also have to stop looking at homes on an individual basis because if one home has gone up in appraisal or assessment, rather not appraisal, assessment, the whole neighborhood or has gone up, the whole community has gone up. So incrementally, it's not like one house is carrying the load on behalf of the entire community. The entire community continues to absorb that tax increase equally because everybody's assessments have gone up relatively equally over time. That's exactly what I was going to say. So in your example, if and it never happens this way because some neighborhoods are different, but if everybody's assessment went up 10% in one year or 15% in one year, if everybody's assessment, then we'd all be paying the same because the mill rate would go down. Our pot of money, or the $25 million in taxes, does not change. Yeah. It's just how it's split <coughs> within that pot. Well, I think what's happening in a lot of the older communities, we're ha seeing some redevelopment where you, you get significantly mm -hmm. more expensive homes going in, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. You, and so that increases everybody's assessment in that neighborhood. Yeah. But that just means that they're paying more on that $100,000. Like everybody in that neighborhood is paying more on that $100,000 per incremental because the assessment of the whole neighborhood went up because somebody built a $2 million home on your street. And if I would also of, point if, out If the rest of the town didn't go with it, then possibly. Yeah, but, if but the everybody's rest still going along it, with it. I think the point that is um, interesting also from a, an appraisal, not an appraisal, an assessment perspective, is that if you have a single family home, those a single family lot in Canmore is a rare to find nowadays. I bet you there's less than a half a dozen of them sitting on the market right now. So that also, the fact that the privilege of living in a single family home also is going to affect um, your assessment to a certain extent because there's a limit to how many of them there are. Mm -hmm. And that's a position of privilege. Yeah. And what we can do, it won't be in time for this budget process, but we can bring a, um, an assessment analysis as we complete assessments. The assessments have to be done by end of January. So in, in Q1 mm -hmm. or whatever, we can, and we did that during uh, the property tax task force time period, right? And we looked at assessments and how they changed over time. Um, and it, it's quite interesting to do, uh, and, and to, you can just get a sense, and uh, to uh, several people's point, I believe the one time we were looking at that, particularly we were looking at the commercial assessment, and at that time, hotel assessments on Bow Valley Trail went way down right. over a three to four year period, but now they've come way back up, right? Um, when we were looking at those individual condo hotels where people had essentially bought a hotel unit, well, those units came way down in value at one point because you couldn't get financing for them, but now they're actually quite attractive because you can rent them out to, um, uh, you know, on an Airbnb or VRBO or whatever. So their assessed values have come way back up. So there, there is this up and down, and um, it, it's very interesting to look at it, but it, uh, generally speaking, if you, if you did a straight line trend, there is a general increase over time. And uh, as long as everybody's going up, then, you know, it just gets split equally. But we can commit to bringing that in uh, 2019 so that, you know, you, you get that sense of where we're at now. 
Okay, so um, moving into the, the capital adjustments then, if this is uh, what we do, if we uh, take the funding envelope and we decrease uh, the capital funding envelope by the reallocation of the Florida's franchise fees in administration's recommendation, which is 330,000 in 2019 and 230,000 in each of the years 2020 through 24, then the total reduction needed in the six-year capital plan is 1.48 million. So we took a look at how we could do that. And this uh, sheet, and, and uh, Rick did hand out, uh, so we, a brand new capital plan, and the projects that are being affected have been identified in blue in these, uh, these sheets. So um, the very first entry there is the series of adjustments council made that resulted in a $37,000 increase. So as we already talked about, that was about four or five projects, right, in and out. And they're highlighted in blue on your uh, sheet as well. And then our proposal is, uh, affects three IT projects. We met with Alan Wingenbach um, and talked to him about the IT projects that are identified um, in line 58, which is the IT strategic plan, uh, and then the disaster recovery plan and business continuity plan. So we asked him to describe those last two plans, the disaster recovery plan and the business continuity plan, and how they differed from what he could expect to do in that first project on line 58. And he, uh, he felt that if we gave him a little bit more budget, that within the IT strat plan recommendations, he would be able to uh, take a look at, at sort of a very um, modest disaster recovery plan approach. Uh, and so our recommendation is that you increase the IT strategic plan recommendations by $16,000, <coughs> so that takes it from 84 to 100. And then you remove uh, the other two projects completely from the plan, the disaster recovery plan and the business continuity plan. Uh, and that would be a $100,000 savings. Any questions there? And then what happens to those two projects? They would not be completed. Um, they, they would they be... come back sometime else? Yeah. yeah. They, sorry, they would be completed uh, differently. I spoke with him this morning, and he would be looking at a higher level uh, report and working with other municipalities, doing more of that work internally as opposed to uh, having an external consultant. So we will still have some of that security feature available, just yeah. not to the extent that we had originally planned. Thanks. Um, yes, Councilman. Uh, who pays the power bills at the roundhouse? Okay, can we just hold sorry, off? I you're looking for questions. When we get to, let, let, we'll okay, get to the roundhouse. Stand, stand um, but if we line. just go line by line? Okay. Yeah, okay. So, um, so that's IT. The biggest one, and has the biggest impact, is to defer the protective services um, project of replacing the ladder truck, or what's affectionately known as the Bronto. Uh, it'll be 20 years old in 2023, so it was put in here um, to sort of to identify it's getting to the end of its uh, it's usable years. life. <laughs> what is that in dog years? <laughs> um, we did get a very detailed email, Sally uh, Cottle reached out to Walter Chief Geller, um, and he provided uh, a review with Greg Burt as well, and they felt that it was reasonable to push that truck outside of the six-year capital plan window into 2025, which would, you know, it does defer it. It's, it's you know, sort of one of those things that uh, Mr. Fark's been harping about. It, it is an asset replacement. <laughs> uh, groaning about an old man. Great. But from a what's available in, in, uh, in this six-year window, um, we feel we can, we can um, stretch the life of that truck to, to beyond its 20-year. And, and you mentioned the conversation you and I had that it would then come back into a future budget. It would be 20... 25. 2025. So, and the truck would be how old at that point? 22 years old. So 22 years old instead of 20. Yeah. And it's, you know, base, we have replaced uh, two fire trucks. Every other truck's been replaced. So we have very good backup. Um, maybe, Sally, you can speak to, there were a couple of strategies that uh, Walter uh, put in his email that he would start to deploy. 
Yeah, so some are that they've made, we've recently made investments into that truck uh, in terms of its maintenance. Um, it, it's actually had a fairly significant maintenance job recently, so it will, should extend the life by a couple years. There's currently no mechanical issues that would warranty an early replacement that we're aware of. They're gonna continue to try to look at um, uh, other ways of running service, so uh, the new rescue truck that's coming could be made the automatic second truck instead of the ladder truck, so we might be able to run the ladder a little bit less, which would also extend its life cycle. So he actually provided quite an extensive response in terms of trying to be able to, to partner to make that happen and felt confident that we could do that. He did indicate that he, he, he feels it will be virtually mandatory by 2025, uh, and we had a bit of a conversation understanding you know, that we can't predict 2025. Um, but he was comfortable with it. So that, that clearly had a big impact uh, if we could move $1.3 million out. Um, now, as we were going with the Finance Committee, we were kind of going line by line through the capital budget and um, we stopped, but we had had some conversation in the initial Finance Committee meetings around the winter trail grooming equipment and the uh, desire or need to add that service, that is a, completely a service enhancement. It's adding a new service of, tra of um, cleaning gravel trails in town during the winter. Um, and based on our understanding of potentially where the Finance Committee was uh, leaning in, in that discussion, we're recommending that that uh, piece of equipment be removed from the budget and we just do not offer that service. So that would not be an en enhanced service at all and we wouldn't do that. So that's $26,000 savings. I, I just was curious what that piece of equipment was. Was it a mechanical thing or was it a motorized thing or? Yeah, so essentially it was similar to what they have at the Nordic Center. So we were looking at either a modified sled or a quad um, that would be able to tow a specific type of grooming equipment behind it okay. on narrow trails. Okay, thank you. Uh, any concern with that? Does that not align with uh, the committee's thinking? Uh, it was something that, that I think some of us considered when we got to the end of that last meeting. Uh, and yeah, so I, I would support that recommendation. Yeah. And then um, as you see at the very top on the title of the slide, we're trying to find 1.48 million. So we were looking through the, the remainder of the projects. Uh, there are two planned for the um, uh, in the facilities department around the roundhouse, which you know we built and lease out to the community daycare society. Um, one was a, a solar project for one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and the other was the cooling system. So, you know, one one is really about saving greenhouse gases and potentially reducing our power bills in the future. Uh, the other one, the cooling system, would, would add to our power bills, uh, but potentially provide a, a more um, comfortable atmosphere and uh, surroundings for the children and their instructors in the roundhouse, which I, I haven't ever worked out of there, but I understand gets pretty hot. So it was never part of the design to have air conditioning there, uh, but this would add that to it. So. Um, I'll put, I think Councillor McCallum, you had a question about? So I had a question about power bills and the answer was mouthed to me. So we pay the power bills. Sorry? No, the tenants, the tenants. Pay the tenants them. pay. Oh, the tenants oh, pay. We pay them, but we pass it on to them. Okay, all right, that's interesting to know. Um, and what was my second question? Uh, so it's our building. As a non-profit, would they have the potential of applying like I know there's lots of grants that we don't have the ability to apply for because we're a municipality are there any grants out there that that they could apply for in terms of um, the putting solar? the solar on themselves potentially yeah it all becomes about a priority about and an expertise grants or yeah. not but they, they would, would have to get our approval to do that right because these, these are building modifications so um, yes and, and so we can equally apply for grants ourselves but Further, grants are never 100%. Yeah, so no, I understand, so, yeah. So they would have to then find a funding mechanism and the daycare is constantly cash-strapped as, mm. uh, as you're aware. So I, I think to get them to fund their own solar would be a challenge. 
I guess I just wonder if it brought their power bills down, it might be worthwhile if they're always so cash strapped. Like one could somewhat replace the other, but uh, that was just a question. I haven't been in that building. So, so, so the payback, it will reduce their annual rate, but mm -hmm. the upfront capital cost is... Um, Could be prohibitive. That, that's right. Okay. So over a period of time, and generally what we look for is about a 15-year payback on solar. Mm -hmm. So you've completely recovered all of your capital costs within 15 mm -hmm. years based on current electricity rates. Mm -hmm. uh, and then beyond that, and the life cycle of the equipment is generally 25 years or longer. Um, beyond that, then you start to get considerable additional savings. Um, and then if electricity rates continue to go up the way they are, then that payback period even comes down lower. So it is a long-term investment, yes. so, but it, it's, it comes with a short-term investment. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mayor Borman? And so if I understand it, uh, we're being asked to choose one or the other. The solar system uh, would um, help address our greenhouse gas reduction targets. Yes? Yes. And the cooling system would have the opposite effect? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and there, there are motions uh, that we have proposed and they're in your package, so we'll get there and you can wait till then to, to decide. Um, what this does, however, is it does get us a little bit higher than the 1.48, which just means um, there's more money left in reserves for capital. Um, which is fine. Um, and so, what's next? Hmm. Organics. We had, um, when Mr. Como was here to talk about uh, the solid waste services and water and wastewater utility, we had a detailed discussion on the organics program. There was concern highlighted by the Finance Committee that there were insufficient resources in the organics budget to, um, to actually deliver on mostly the commercial uh, aspect of the organics program. So I'm going to let Mike Fark speak to this next slide and what we're proposing. These are responses from Mr. Como, I guess. Right. So, so indeed, Council asked us to do some more work, so we went back and we did revisit it. Um, and so the, based on that reanalysis, um, administration is proposing to increase the promotion and education budget from 20K back up to the originally planned 50K, recognizing that it's actually not going to be any easier to implement commercial than it was the originally full um, fully planned organics program uh, and uh, heavy investment in education uh, and engagement will be required. So we are proposing to do that in, in any event. Um, but then there's an additional possibility. So we have to look at um, the resources required to support the project. So we can do this one of two ways. We are proposing as part of this budget to put the sustainability coordinator position, which is currently a half time into a full time position. Um, one of the things that council did uh, with their previous motions is they removed the ACA land transfer project from the capital budget already. Uh, and that was one of the projects that was meant to be managed by the sustainability coordinator. Um, there are a number of other large projects that are expected to take up her other 50% of capacity from what, uh, what, what is currently placed. However, we could do a rebalancing and reprioritization of that uh, and we could have the sustainability coordinator lead the implementation of the organics. Um, so that, in, under that scenario, we're only proposing to increase the budget by the 30,000 for the education and engagement. Um, and then we would have um, the sustainability coordinator, coordinator lead that implementation. We do, however, still have some concerns over whether or not that is sufficient capacity, um, given the fact that it is going to be a complex project that will require quite some support. Earlier this year, we, um, FCM uh, came out with a grant opportunity, um, and it was specifically for a climate change coordinator. So it was a grant that was open to municipalities to implement new initiatives specifically to address climate change. We applied for that grant um, early on, pre-budget process, but then through the budget process, we determined we did not include that in the budget. And the reason for that is because although it, the grant would be an 80% funding of the position, there would still be a matching municipal contribution. That matching contribution would be $20,000, $23,000 a year, essentially over uh, a year for two years. So the grant would fund a position for two years. Uh, it's a term position only. 
Um, and basically looking at all the other priorities and, and constraints on the budget, we didn't feel we could justify the 23000 a year um, ask, basically. Um, but with the discussion around organics, what we are looking at is there could be a possibility there if we get the grant, and we should have the answer to that essentially by the end of next week. So we'll know prior to council approving, or we should know prior to council approving the final budget, whether or not we'll get the grant. If we do get the grant, then council may want to consider including um, that 45,000 um, in the budget uh, to allow us to actually take advantage of that position. Because you know, if you can get something that is 80% funded by another level of government, then that is good value for the municipality. So again, the second option there, it says an addition of 210,000. Uh, and the reason I've done that, and Rick is probably looking at me a little bit funny, is um, that's the total cost of the position over two years. So if we're going to do it, we need to have the total cost in the budget, because even if we get the grant money, we still need council's permission to spend it. So the 210 would fund the position for the full two years, of which 45K, uh, 45,000 would be funded by the reserve and the balance would be funded by the grant. So we are putting that out there as, um, as a potential option. What's interesting is that utilities, or sorry, Simon and Andreas, they did an analysis on sort of both scenarios, just the 30,000 and the additional 45,000 for the position. Um, and what they have determined is that both of those could be funded from the solid waste services utility with no impact of the utility rates. Essentially, once again, because the utilities also have reserves, it would be a minor adjustment in the reserves, but we would still meet our reserve targets over the five-year window, as we always do, or we always look to do. So it wouldn't actually impact the utility rates to include that position, and it would have no impact um, on, on the tax discussion that we are currently having. So we could do it and accommodate it within the, um, the utility rates that have been already been proposed to council. So essentially we wanted to raise this to the committee and give you the opportunity to discuss it and debate and decide which way you want to go. We can accommodate with existing resources or, and our, our recommendation is essentially, we should make this grant dependent. So if we get the grant, then it makes sense to move forward in this way. If we don't get the grant, we wouldn't propose funding the full 210,000 out of the utility because then it does affect the rates and, uh, and it, it becomes too much of an ask. Mayor Borwin? So firstly, I, I I will support increasing the promotion and education budget. I, I do think that's important. We've learned through, well, beyond curbside, that education is it's critical. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the second part of that is uh, related to the work that the sustainability coordinator would be charged with doing. And if the grant doesn't come in and, and so we don't move forward with with that suggestion, um, I'm confident that there's still adequate work for the sustainability coordinator to do. Yeah. Justify that. Yeah. Um, so what you just uh, outlined, I think, is, is it's easy for me to support moving forward that way. I, I think it's a real net gain for uh, in in that discussion that we've been talking about. Yeah. And, organics. and if we get the grant. Um, and we get the climate change coordinator position funded by the grant, um, there will still be, the majority of their time will still be in, involved with just implementing organics. That is, a, that's gonna be a big project. The added bonus may be, there may be some additional capacity that we could use to support other, um, other initiatives, most likely in solid waste services, so looking at efficiency of recycling and other things, waste diversion that we, we could look at. Um, so there may be a bonus of some additional capacity, but it may be that they are fully consumed by organics. But, but it, it's, reach, it's helping us reach our target of reduced GHGs. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, thrust, uh, the other stream of that for us is the uh, solar panels, and, and that would be managed through facilities more in any case, wouldn't it? So facilities will manage the solar installations on all buildings, with the exception of the ones at um, solid waste services. So right. solid waste services, as part of that project implementation, they will they will manage their own. Right. So we're not uh, losing any opportunity or any resource on that no. work through uh, dedicating the coordinator primarily to organic. Councilor Comfort? Yeah, I uh, also could support certainly the increase in promotion and education, because um, 
I think in matters uh, environmental, you have to tell people, tell them again, tell them again, beat them up, tell them again. So I think that's a good idea. Um, and also, um, I really, I, it would be wonderful if we got the grant. I, I have a question about GHG. Um, do we get any actual like credit for that? Does like, is there any kind of monetary or material credit, or we just get a gold star? Yeah, so un unfortunately, uh, we are not currently involved in the carbon exchange, carbon credit exchange. Um, that market has been problematic for a number of years and, uh, and has never really matured in the way that people thought it would. Uh, Alberta doesn't participate in a, um, provincially doesn't participate in a program that would facilitate that. Um, what's interesting is Ontario and Quebec did, and then the uh, recent Ontario government just pulled out of that. Really? Yes. So it's... Um, the short, the short answer is no. Uh, there, there isn't an opportunity to ca get a cash credit back for the GHG reductions. What there is is the incentive on our electricity rates um, and then on our environmental oh, footprint. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, so what I'm hearing is that we apply for a grant, we fund 45000 of our own money for that to get that grant, for two but we years. get an extra per person for two, years. Those, for two years. Um, and that person would be responsible for organics. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, if we don't get the grant, our current sustainability coordinator would be responsible for organics. We will have to reprioritize other work that is on her plate in order to accommodate that, and it may be that, um, so we had talked about leaving the $45,000 in the budget to allow for some contracted services to support that. So the 45000 could remain in regardless but the rest of the, if we don't get the rest of the grant, then we would um, not spend, obviously, the full 210, which was the grant portion. Okay. Right. Um, one of the things that I was wondering about um, bringing back into the budget was the GHG reduction tactical report. Could this particular position person lead that? Do something with it or advance it somehow? Potentially, than, yes. Yeah. I mean, that, that was... Uh, that was a project that um, our sustainability coordinator argued quite strongly to keep in. Hmm. Um, we pulled it out because it was a new and enhanced um, and that it was um, a lesser priority than some of the other capital projects. And moreover, it, it does provide us another plan which can help guide future activities, but we've done a lot of plans lately mm -hmm. uh, and we felt we would rather prioritize actual initiatives. So if it was a choice between implementing solar and producing another plan, we chose to prioritize the solar in that case. But yes, in theory, if we had this position, this is something that, if the time allowed, they could look at advancing. Okay. And the, the organics group, the core group, um, they had offered to participate somehow in the education component of it? Yes. Is that something that we can... Take advantage of? Take, well, yeah. use, use their expertise, use their volunteer time. Yes, and it's something that we would love to do. Yeah, because I think those grassroots things, you know, people respond to them really well in the community when your neighbor is doing something and you recognize that face and, you yeah. know, there's something happening um, from that perspective. Yeah, Mr. Soto told me a great story this morning about how when you rolled out the Beyond Curbside, um, oh, the, uh, oh, the Bear Bins, there was a community group that supported that initiative as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so certainly we could look at taking advantage of that. Yeah, so through that educational component, we can work right. with them potentially. Right. Yes. Okay, um, that's all my questions, thanks. Okay, uh, any other question on the organics? Okay, so, so can, um, I just, yep. can you just yes. clarify for me um, the advocacy that's being done around implementing a phase of organics earlier than the rest of it. I'm, I'm not clear on. People are asking for the bin, the five bin system before we get the full infrastructure in place. Is that Yeah. So, so what CORE requested was that um, given the fact that it will take us time to get our infrastructure in place to get the organics program up and running, what they've requested is that we contact the town of Banff and see if we could find an interim solution to have the town of Banff essentially service our organics in the period of time it would take us to get our organics program up and running. Uh, so that was their request. Is it possible? Is it something we could potentially do? Is it? It's, I know it's, it's not, I know it, you know, there were, there are a number of plans that were presented sure. to us. So it's not currently accommodated within the existing budget. 
So if we were to do that in addition to rolling out our own program, we'd have to go back and do a cost analysis and, uh, and see what that would look like. Uh, and then we would have to engage the town of Banff to see what is possible from their side. Banff indicated some interest that they could participate up to a limited amount and their, their, their amount was three to 400 tons a year. Um, so under the presumption that we would collect less than three or 400 tons in the year it would take us to get our program up and running, that could be possible. But again, we'd have to analyze what the cost uh, of that would be because we haven't accommodated that. Yeah, so the, the capital cost of purchasing the bins is in 2019. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we could certainly purchase the bins. It comes down to then the operating cost of uh, starting to collect the material from that bin and transferring it to the town of Banff and paying the town of Banff a tipping fee. So we'd have to, um, you know, it, if we ordered the bins today, they, they would come in a couple of months kind of thing and we'd have to do some site prep. Probably couldn't get them installed till the spring at least, till the, the ground is, uh, doesn't have frost in it. So, you know, you could potentially do a six, six month. month. Um, you, you, you might get optimistically six months early. Um, again, at, but that at, operating cost is not in the budget. That, that's right. That. And, and so, again, we'd have to, nor is the tipping cost with the town of Banff. So the short answer is, if you want us to explore that, we would need a motion from the Finance Committee directing administration to go back and explore what that option would look like and come back with the costing, because I don't feel comfortable speculating on exactly what the cost or the impact would be without that information. So you're saying our full, robust plan would kick in in 2020? That's correct. This plan would not kick in until halfway through like an alternative plan if there was such the, a thing the, the, the best case with scenario, more money the, the best case scenario would be um second half of 2019 we could potentially have a pilot program up and running depending on again the timing of infrastructure and when we could get things in place but more money would be required to more money do would be required program. to do that that's right okay council McCallum? but under the current plan we would be composting as of the first month of 2020 so I need to verify that it's intended to be early 2020, yes. Okay, I just want to know if we're still going to wait for the same half a year as we right. would with no, the 2019 no. start. As Mr. Soto pointed out, the, um, we can order and if the budget is approved, mm -hmm. we can order the, the equipment and have it installed in 2019. What we're essentially suggesting is it will take us most of 2019 to get that up and running. Mm. The big uh, component for us is going to be the addition of the two bays at the recycling center right. uh, and the construction of that and depends entirely on how quickly we're able to tender that and then get that work complete okay. so so i'm, I'm just a, a bit confused here so it would be um we could get the bins yeah. pronto pronto and we could contract banff to collect it there would be a cost of course yes maybe. um we're not certain there, there would be a cost there would well, be a cost. Be a cost, but yes. No, no. There would be a maybe tipping fee. Maybe we can get them to do it. Maybe, maybe oh, we can. There would yeah, be a yeah, cost. Yeah. Yes, yes. But they may have not. To well, that no, I, I, I've spoken with uh, Robert Earl, the town of Banff, and he's saying yeah. they could do okay. it for a cost. Yeah. You can do anything for Robert for a right. cost. Right. <laughs> yeah. Robert Earl, for a price. Yes. Yes. Our five bins. So um, I'm just trying to get a handle on uh, the cost would have to come later, of course, but on the timing. Like, how much would we gain in starting? time ways, so e even a, a more limited program than what we were planning, Right. Uh, how much time would be able to advance? So again, under the assumption that um, we could order the bins and get them in place and order the truck and get them in place and recruit a staff member again, we can do that in 2019. Um, and again, to Mr. So's point about frost on the ground and the timing it takes to actually install these, we could have them in essentially for the second half of 2019. Um, that would be the, in my opinion, that would be the earliest that even the pilot supported by Banff could start. Okay. Right? So you could potentially have organics collected from just the five bins for the second half of 2019, which would put us probably six, maybe eight months in advance of when we would anticipate the full program would start. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on organics? Um, so maybe Mike, you can just clear up. Do you need both motions potentially passed, or are they they two? No, two, 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 se two separate. Yeah, they are two or. separate. Yeah, it's, it's, an a, or. It, it's an or. Oh, it's an or. So yeah. um, I think what we're what I'm hearing is potentially that the second motion is is supported. So I'll, I'll look to somebody on the finance committee if they'd like to. Ma ma we're at the point now of go time making motions <laughs> so we've got a series of motions over the next few slides for your consideration based on all of our discussions today and the first one is up here yep councillor seeley can we take a break first oh yeah uh, councillor seeley is asking for a break so yes we can 
um, uh, come back at at noon. Okay, ten ten minute break till noon.
so uh, we call the Finance Committee back to order. And we left off with the discussion on organics and uh, about to make a motion. Um, Mr. Fark has explained that you um, should consider either the first motion or the second motion. So I will ask one of the committee members to put forward a motion. Mayor Borman. Yeah, and I'll move the second recommendation that Finance Committee amend the budget to $2,915,000, up $240,000 and approve a change of scope to include a resource to support implementation grant dependent. Um, and I'll support the motion uh, because it would seem silly not to try, uh, if, see if we can get some grant money to, uh, to help us move forward in, in a more informed way uh, on our organics delivery. And obviously if the grant fails, then admin would have to come back and uh, ask council to reconsider uh, direction, but given the discussion, the presentation, the discussion, I, I think that's the, the best um, direction for council to follow on delivery of organic. Council Comfort, uh, I also I would support that motion, and uh, I think if we're going to do this, we have to set it up for success. We have to apply as much as we can to it, and I also would encourage administration, although I'm sure they're already on this to um, use the expertise that we have in the community represented by CORE and other groups because they're just raring to go on this. So, yeah, that's it. Any other discussion on the motion? Okay, so I'll, I'll move that that motion uh, be accepted as presented. Those in favor? Uh, carried unanimously. Okay, so before we get to the... Uh, I'll yes? have a second. You have a second motion? motion? Okay, sorry, to Councilor. Direct administration to work with the town of Banff to assist in delivery of compost uh, collection of the five neighborhood bins in 2019. Does that effectively do what we're talking about doing? So, would you like us to move straight to do that, or would you like us to come back with an analysis of cost first for consideration? The latter. The latter. But, oh. but the important part is communicating with Banff and seeing if. Sure, so. So could you reread your motion, Mayor Borman, please? Uh, directed men to work with the town of Banff. To assess. To assess uh, the assistance for delivery of composting collection and bring council uh, an analysis of the costs. Yeah, for 2019. Right. Okay, so um, just to be clear, that may or may not happen before budget approval time, or you want it before, is no, there a date? No, 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 post budget. In, during 2019? Yeah. Okay, during 2019. Just to, to the effect of the conversation yeah. we were having. Right. If we can right. start the, the five bin collection in 2019. Right. Okay, great. so that the, if there was a budget or a rate impact or something, we would have to bring that back yeah. to um, council. We, we will try to bring it back to you before budget approval on the 18th, if possible, but we can't guarantee that sure. that's possible. That's fine. Uh, okay, is everybody clear on the motion? Because it's not up. Okay, any other comments on that motion? Okay, I'll, I'll move that it uh, be approved as discussed. Those in support? Those opposed? Uh, it's carried with Councillor McCallum opposed. Uh, okay, so before we get into the rest of the motions, which would um, achieve what we discussed this morning, during the break there were some questions on capital and it was... Uh, I was reminded that count, the Finance Committee had gone through each capital area and every project, um, and we hadn't had the opportunity to finish that process. So some on council would like the opportunity to discuss capital projects. So uh, is that uh, work for everybody to, to continue that? I, I believe we finished uh, at the end of, well, we were in the facilities area and had been talking about all of the solar projects. So that's... Um, Page 10, and I believe we had we had talked about um, some of the facilities projects, but I'm just wondering if there are any other projects within the facilities department that are being proposed for the six-year plan that council wanted to question or discuss. Yes, Councillor Comfort. Uh, this is the new handout, right? Uh, yes, you can look at the yeah. new handout. They're the same except for the blue, blue text. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm not seeing anything in facilities that anybody wants to discuss. Um, planning, there were a couple of projects in planning that are actually funded and then uh, several that are unfunded. Any discussion on any of those projects in the planning department? Okay, you can always come back if I've skipped it. So now we're into engineering flood projects. This is towards the bottom of page 10. There's the Steep Creek Hazard Mitigation Program out in 2022. I just, I think it's worth reminding council that there's a number of projects that are already approved that will actually get delivered in this six year window, but don't show up here because we've already approved them. So that includes, for example, the Steep Creek Hazard Mitigation on Cougar Creek. Right, so that we are hopeful will get underway in 2019, um, but it, that was approved several years ago. Uh, okay, so then entering in, yes, I Councilor. I have a question on the, um, sorry, going back a little bit, um, on the repurpose the fire hall to, to something new. Um, wouldn't there have to be like a, does that mean there'd be a, that amount of money, is that a, a plan? Is that putting a plan together and a budget and like that? So we are currently doing a conceptual design and plan for location and um, sort of size and, and scale and scope. Uh, and that will be coming to you, Ms. Cottle, in the new year uh, for review and understanding um, and likely selection of location and, and concept. And then this budget in 2020 would allow us to design it do detailed design, and then in 2021, construct. And but I'm thinking about the repurpose of the old fire hall. Ah, uh, sorry. So, so, yeah, and, and, and for that one, it's unfunded currently. Basically, it depends entirely on the future direction that council chooses regarding the actual fire hall. So it, it, is, it is just a placeholder right now, okay. and that's why it's unfunded. Okay. Yeah. So currently, yes, because um, some people are asking where on the plan that is. That's showing out in 2023. It says it's a deep project, so it's unfunded, yeah. fire hall repurposed for different use. So if we move the fire hall outside of the downtown core, okay. it would be up to council to consider whether you want to use that for office space, rent it to community groups, sell demolish it, it, sell it, housing, housing. All, of the all of the above, exactly. But Thank that'll you. be a future discussion. Thank we'll, you. We'll talk. Okay, so uh, we're down now into engineering. There's uh, four projects on the bottom of page 10 in engineering, all in 2019. Any questions on any of those projects? Okay, moving to page 11. We're still in engineering and there's a series of projects. Um, the way we budget for these projects is in um, sort of buckets in, in each year with the, the, the projects defined in 2019 and 2020, but out in future years, those projects are not fully defined. Yes, Councillor Mara? I was just looking at um, the Bull Valley Trail West Pathway improvements. Now, the, the funding model is MSI capital and then provincial grants. The MSI capital, can you use for anything? Or it has to be specifically... So MSI grants, I'll, I'll let Rick, there, there are some criteria, but yeah, it's yeah. pretty broad. Pretty general, I mean, it's, yeah. You can't use it for operating costs and things like that, but we could use it for most things it covered. It's, it's several pages list though. So we could use MSI grants to fund any capital. And if you recall, we were proposing to use a million to fund the organics mm -hmm. implementation, right? Um, but we could put it to, to street and rehab projects. We could put it to utility projects, yes. There's a list of criteria that the province provides for what you can apply it for, but it is very broad. It's very broad, okay. So it doesn't have to be specifically in, what are we in here? In it, engineering? No, no. no. So we, we, we fund projects in engineering and facilities and public works, uh, protective services, fire trucks are uh, MSI eligible, for example. So we could we could use it to purchase a but fire the, truck. The, the brunt of the funding is FG, uh, the federal gas tax. And that's the yes. same application, it can pretty much go anywhere? No, mm, it's very so, restricted. So, so federal thought, gas tax is very restricted. Mm -hmm. It right. can only really be applied for certain projects of which this is Right, eligible. so only 875 is, is out, of, out of MSI. 
and the balance is federal gas tax. That's my, uh, Rick, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Page 130. No, Bow Valley Trail Bow West Trail. Pathway. Okay. Councilor Mara, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions on any of the engineering projects? Yeah. Yes, Councilor Comfort, um, sorry. <clears throat> the bus stop improvements at 1 million two. Yeah. <clears throat> Where's the funding from that coming from? It's, it says grants, but yeah. so, so the majority of that is green trip funded. Um, okay. I believe it's 70 75 green trip, and then the balance, Rick, is is MSI. So is MSI. 847,000 green trip and 423,000 MSI. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So we uh, there is a matching component to green trip. Yeah. So we get green trip funding that has to go to transit, but we must match it. And we're choosing to use MSI grants to per use matching. the matching funds yeah. rather than tax. Money. Rather than yeah whatever. reserves or yeah. whatever yeah yes Count Mayor Borman I just wanted to have some conversation around the uh, project under engineering the, the last one it's a D the pedestrian crossing uh, and there is no uh, project sheet for a description but we all know the project so I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with not even starting to plan for that until 2024. Um, so the, the rationale behind that is um, the necessity for the pedestrian crossing at Palliser is really brought on uh, by the additional development on the Palliser lands. So that's the, silver, the three silver tip parcels and the CCHC affordable housing lands. Uh, we currently don't have a plan uh, to, or there's no indication that that development will start soon. Um, should that development start soon, we can always um, come back and we can change the plan and change the timing of this project. But as it stands currently, there isn't a, a trigger for us to move forward with that project. Um, we are, however, making, in the current budget, we are making significant improvements on Palliser um, uh, to, up to bench lands and then across the bridge that will better serve the community that is there currently because that's one of the big concerns is that they don't have great connectivity currently. The, that's the Hector, the Blackiston, and the Northview uh, developments currently. So we are in the budget. There's, uh, there are dollars to improve that connectivity that will act as an interim step until such time as uh, the ped bridge becomes necessary. Yeah, so it's sort of a cart before the horse thing, which comes first. And, and I would suggest that um, the conversations we're going to have at CCHC board level uh, in the near future and, and likely at council as well, uh, I, I, I hope will result in planning for a, a, another project to be delivered by CCHC before 2026 or whenever this might kick in. Yeah. But if, if, if that's a constraint, if, if the conversation always comes back to, well, we can't do anything there until the ped bridge is there. That, that's not how administration, either at the town or at CCHD, is approaching it. It's essentially, when we have an indication that development will proceed, then we can plan for the, okay, for the well, ped bridge. Okay, well, let's go on the assumption development will proceed there within the next few years. Let's, for the sake of argument, so, assume that. Well, so uh, again, the what was just previously discussed and, and approved by council was that the next step for the town and CCHC is to look at the housing needs study yeah. and to update the chat. And then based right. on that, we will plan uh, and look at what future projects may be and what demand for future projects may be. Um, so we would anticipate um, by the time we come back for the next, bu next budget cycle, which will be in the fall of 2020, that work will com be complete. We'll have a complete picture of what that looks like and we'll have already had the discussions with CHC, CCHC and Council in terms of what the next project would be and would be identified at that point. And then at that point, if there was a need to amend the budget at that time to change the timing of the ped bridge, we could certainly do that. And what's the downside of humoring me by moving, <laughs> moving, that, into, moving that into 2020 now? It's an unfunded You could make project. the uh, well, amendment, Mayor Borrowman, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> yeah. You can certainly move yeah. it sooner, but as an unfunded project, we You'd have to do find work funding on it. I understand unless it's that. Funded. But there's there's something that it adds quality to the conversation <laughs> if we see that okay in in a year we're going to start uh, discussing the possibility. 
rather than five or six years out. And I appreciate that this is only the, the planning budget, not the actual delivery. Yes. But um, I'm on a roll here. Councillor Comfort? Yeah, I um, feel that I have to support that. There's a lot of people living there already. And we all have seen those photos of people crossing the highway. And when it's winter time, it's even worse. It's big and wide. And my fear is that someone will actually get injured or killed crossing the highway. And that we really need to address this sooner rather than later. So just to, to finish. Don't mean to be melodramatic. Sorry, I thought you were finished. I said I was just on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, given that discussion, I, I will move that uh, we amend the capital budget by pulling that project into 2020. Uh, just as it shows here, uh, not showing any funding or just a placeholder. I, I know Councillor McCallum yeah, had her hand. Can we still talk? Can we still talk? Pardon me? Can we still talk about this project? Before yep, we absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where I was going. So uh, that's good to know. This is just planning dollars. This isn't actually for the bridge. Yeah. And so the actual pedestrian bridge, um, that we are possibly considering was priced out during the Olympic exercise, and that was a total number of about $5 million, correct? Correct. So if you're gonna do that, Your Worship, then I would think that you would want to put at least a year later or two years later that placeholder number of $5 million so that it's clear to the public that a pedestrian bridge unfunded is not gonna cost us 250 grand. I didn't wanna start um, plucking numbers no, I, out of the air at and this I get point. That. But I, I and, and I think it's a, a good idea. Uh, I still would like to point out to council that there was not an underpass to the other side of Cooper Creek until that entire neighborhood was completely built out. And so, uh, and it is still against the law to run across the highway. Um, there are some, uh, affordable housing units on that side of the highway, but the majority of them are still market units. So to imply that because, mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that that's what you're implying, no. but I'm hoping, that that's what I feel like people have been implying though in general, is because there's affordable housing units, somehow there's a good reason for them to run across the highway because they can't afford a car. I, I don't know where that discussion comes from, but what I would love to talk about in conjunction with this um, is an actual, uh, with the CHAP update, with um, the, uh, the housing needs study informing that CHAP update is actually um, talking more holistically about that entire property as opposed to just one more project. I'd like council to have a discussion at some point around a master planning exercise for those entire lands so that we can um, look at uh, some sort of local improvement levy on the front end of paying for this bridge paying um, for mm -hmm. the improvements, paying for the flood mitigation, paying for the hydro line to be moved, um, as opposed to just a, a onesies, twosies mm -hmm. um, project. The, the Olympic um, exercise allowed us the opportunity to price out what those projects would cost. And so now that we have that big picture look, let's look at the entire property with a mm -hmm. larger, wider and, and lens. Don't and so I would prefer to see a master planning exercise budgeted in there mm -hmm. um, versus uh, the ped bridge quite yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, Councillor Comfort had her hand up. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to say that I did not mean okay. to in any way no, imply no. that. Okay. Uh, what I meant, what I know is that people will always take the shortest line to a destination and if that's across the highway and that's all they have time for, that's what they'll do. So mm -hmm. that, that's all I was saying. We know that people are doing that. We know they're putting themselves at risk and it's just a public safety thing. And I think, I agree with you, I think a master plan would be a great idea and to inc include the infrastructure improvements that we need to get the things that we need for people. So I can just remind council that in the Silvertip ASP, there's actually already a commitment and an expectation mm -hmm. that the town and Silvertip engage in a master planning process so that is all, and it is in planning and on planning's radar, right. um, and we do have it in our work plan. But again, it is predicated upon an actual intent to move forward with development. Well, right? but we have an intent to move forward with development through CCHC. So, as a landowner there, don't we have the opportunity to pull that trigger? So we certainly could. Uh, up until this point, um, 
CCHC has not indicated that um, there is no plan currently mm -hmm. to develop on those lands yeah. in the near term. And I, I don't want to get ahead of, of all of yes, this. Yes, exactly. Um, CCHC is likely to have those discussions this year once we've seen the CHAP and the mm -hmm. housing study. After uh, I had a, a debrief with Lisa and, and some of the other senior admin yesterday on uh, the work we did for 2026, and one of the takeaways was that that we, we can't let um, we can't let go of the work we've done no, on planning for the housing there. So we have to keep that in the active file, uh, which is one reason I, I would like to move this forward. And and uh, the master planning exercise is already on the list, so we have to get moving on that. Once CCHC has had probably much of this year to, to assess the effect and the impact on the new housing that's come to play and the impact of the, the studies. So um, again, the, the, my amendment is, is simply to pull it forward as a placeholder just to make it clear that council is has intent to move ahead with, with developing that land as soon as it uh, is supported by CCHC or, or whatever. If you wanted to make a, a subsequent, uh, an amending motion to my motion to have admin populate the subsequent years, that's fine. I, I don't think we need it at that detail at this time, but it's 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 more. Um, I feel like though it's a court cart before the horse, your worship. Like part of the cost of the bridge and where the bridge is going to go and all of those things is going to be part of that larger master planning exercise. Like. When I mean, uh, like, I guess I, I don't, except for optics, I don't see any other reason why to actually put that in unless we're actually going to put the full cost of what we expect a master planning exercise to look like. Um, and, and to include mm -hmm. that as, as, as part of the discussion perhaps in following years, I think, and I'm not necessarily against putting it in, I think at this point I'd like to have more discussion and more thought about what a total number would look like. Um, and instead of just putting $250,000 in and not putting any of the work and the cost of that work in advance of that number in the plan. Mm -hmm. Can we save that for another meeting? Can we have more discussion well, about that sure. and save yeah. that motion? Because we still have another budget meeting left. Yep, uh, ne yeah. next Tuesday. Yeah. If, if we don't conclude either. today, we have next Tuesday, yep. I can either Because um, that's the one thing postpone. that came out of the Olympic exercise for me yeah. was realizing that, you know, a lot of the projects that we have been done have been to respond or react to an immediate need, but we know now what that cost is going to be. We now know um, that the developer that co-shares some of those lands uh, in that area is looking to have a planning exercise as well. And if we, and you've spoken to it before about how, you know, the CCHC machine gets going and then we stop, and then we've gotten going and then we stop. And this is a real way for us to get some momentum and uh, initiative and to behave like a developer of nonprofit housing and to look at those lands holistically and, you know, plan it out and then I pre sell a building, build it. Pre sell a building, build it. Um, and what I saw in Whistler when I checked out the Olympic Village there is a real indication of what they did over a short period of time. Um, and, uh, and they built a real neighborhood. And that's what I would love to see Council uh, imagine alongside their partners at CCHC right. is to build a beautiful, inclusive neighborhood on that side of the highway, mm -hmm. not just plunk um, uh, housing in a reactive, sort of responsive manner to an immediate need that we have. And I'm proud of what we've put over there so far, don't get me wrong, but I just think that um, we have limited opportunity and this bridge is super important to the overall discussion of that planning exercise. And so I just would like to have more time to discuss that in council and to find out what other people think and to I guess to understand maybe in discussions with admin what a master planning exercise is. Is that something we do in-house? Is that something that we assign dollars to? Because we see inward facing projects get pushed back and back and back and back. Yet if we intentionally and thoughtfully fund them, they get done. So I'm gonna 
try to move us forward here. And I, I completely understand what uh, you're saying, Council McCallum. I'm wondering if it is a budget discussion or a more strategic discussion. So Council will need to do some strategic planning. It's a mostly, you know, because you've got a new strategic plan, it's mostly a check-in in early in the new year. We'll set up two or three days to say what's emerging, what's new, what do we need to have more discussion around. And, and this, to me, sounds like a good half-day discussion um, and that admin can prep for and plan for. I guess the question is, uh, Mayor Borman, uh, whether you want to keep your motion on the floor right now around just symbolically moving this, and, and then we can we can have a strategic discussion because uh, I'm not sure we would be able to to put that into the the capital plan today or oh, no, in the next that's week, sort right? Sort of why I want to have a bigger because it's not right. just about 200 grand; it's right. a bigger right. conversation. Yeah, and I agree with everything you said, and, and it sort of reflects some of the discussion we had yesterday about how we have to move forward with with uh, future housing mm -hmm. in that area. I'm, I'm I'm only saying that if we show planning to start in 2024 on delivering uh, the possibility of, of housing up there, it it becomes low priority in people's minds, and if we're if we say, at the very least, we're going to start planning for that uh, actively in 2020, that puts it up in, in the higher priority level. Not negating anything you said about mm -hmm. the need to actual, actually have a vision for what it may look like and do that work. But I don't think that there's an impetus actually yet in terms of development to be able to, to, to qualify bringing it up. And, and when we have an impetus to do so, we have a project, we have a plan, we have mm -hmm. you know, a, a revised ASP, we have you know, a strat plan that reflects development from CCHC. I don't see the, and it's unfunded, I don't see the value in bringing it up um, until we actually have an impetus to mm -hmm. bring it up. And I'm not seeing that impetus right now. I would now. argue that the imp impetus exists from the existing housing. And I understand what you're saying, but uh, I believe that with the current housing level there and the anticipated, not even our project, but, but other projects that may start up there in the next few years, I, th I think it's a good time to actually have the conversation and plan the pedestrian bridge, not only for future benefit, but for today's benefit. Regardless of the fact we're gonna make it easier to, to move from the Palliser over to bench lands and down, I, I, I'm supportive of moving forward with a pedestrian bridge planning exercise in the near future. So oh. I, I don't think there's going to be much value in more debate at this point. Mm. I think I, we should call the question in. Oh, forward. I thought that you were willing to wait to talk about this, about putting this back into the budget until we had another question and had, had a further conversation. Uh, about right this. now, the motion is, is to pull that $250,000 into the 2020 bucket. And I, I think with the caveat that we'll have a strategic discussion sure. around the planning exercise that you're articulating, Councillor McCallum, uh, in the spring and, and then talk in next fall how we bring that back into the budget should that be a strategic priority of councils and, um, uh, and we want to move that forward in the 2020 um, budget or uh, beyond. But what Mayor Borman is saying is he still wants to move forward with this motion as a symbolic gesture for the pedestrian bridge. So we'll- A bit more than symbolic, but fair enough okay. to let that go. Okay. Uh, so on uh, Mayor Borman's motion to bring the $250,000 into 2020, but still as an unfunded project, those in support- Can we, sorry, so can we be more articulate in terms of the naming of that project? Because it makes it look like we're building a bridge for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we know very clearly it, that it's, it should say design. Yes, design. it should design planning, design or de design planning or something Except like that. that is so a friendly you, amendment. Is the friendly amendment, Your Worship? Thank yep. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, with that uh, as amended, those in support? Opposed? So that's carried with Councillor Mara and McCallum opposed. Okay. Any other discussion um, items on? Uh, the engineering department's oh. budget. Yes, Councillor? Sorry, there's just a misspelling. I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> help yourself. It's 140. Uh, it's just below 140. It's C Project Aerial Imagery Update. Aerial is misspelled. Okay. Yes, it is. I, I thought I was talking about the Disney character. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments, discussion points on engineering's projects? 
then into public works. I believe we talked about all of those when uh, Mr. Como was here, but we haven't um, done a once through with uh, the Finance Committee. So we had uh, already talked about that, um, wherever it is now, the, the trail page, surface. Oh, sorry, that's on page 12. So we're still on page 11. Any questions on those public works projects? Yes, yeah. Mayor Borman? Bless you. Mayor Borman? Yeah. So uh, 146, the playground replacement, Lions Park. So this is to replace the playground. I remember seeing the map, and it's project proposed to be moved up into the treated area to the north or whatever of the tennis courts. But this is, uh, is this entirely connected to the, uh, or in conjunction with the tennis court expansion? Or is this recommended in independently of the tennis court work? So they are in conjunction. Um, the, the Lions play, Park playground is due to be life cycled. So um, we would be looking at replacing that sometime in the next couple of years regardless. Um, but the, there's additional cost associated here with moving it to the location um, related to tree clearing and, and surface preparation. So um, the full cost of this project would only go ahead if the tennis courts project goes ahead. Um, if the tennis courts is not going to go ahead, then we would have to um, look at that a bit more closely. I mean, uh, essentially we would have to plan for when that, the tennis court expansion would occur. But we're not replacing the playground because we're trying to accommodate the tennis court. We're, yeah, so we've, it's like Tetris. We have to move one to be able to place the, the other. That's right. We need to okay. move the playground in order to, ex to expand the tennis but courts. The playground has met its the, life cycle. The playground it's, is due to be life cycle. Yes. yes. Although, I think we've pushed this forward now yeah, already two yeah, years. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Yes. Thank you. So this project is, is not dependent on the tennis court project. So what is dependent on the tennis court project is the actual location. So if we were just going to replace the playground in its existing location, we would do it for less money than what is currently proposed here because we would reuse the existing site right. and that would be less expensive. Um, so, okay, so there's additional cost to relocate it yes. in anticipation of the tennis court. That's expansion. correct, yes. And, and where's the tennis court expansion project sitting right now? It currently sits in the D category of, uh, of unfunded um, for the full amount. The expectation being that the tennis club is intended to uh, come forward with a plan to fundraise to, um, to realize that expansion. So um, it's safe to, to expect that to happen and, and the tennis court project is high probability at this point? Yeah, so the tennis club is very motivated uh, and they've got a good group of people who are promoting this project. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the true cost of the project, which is at 800,000, uh, they've already indicated is beyond the scope of what they think they can reasonably fundraise for. So administration is reaching out to them and trying to work with them to uh, find some solutions um, and what that could look like. They have applied for a grant, they will do some fundraising, but even with the grant and the fundraising, it still wouldn't be sufficient. So they're looking at also potentially requesting a loan and repaying that back over a period of years uh, and other potential scenarios. So um, this is why it's a bit complicated with this one because sure. it, yeah. it depends really on how things progress with the tennis club. Yeah, and I've seen the... But it depends on tennis. It's not an issue. On the... Uh, the, the on Yes, for the, for the park, it does not say that, yes. Because um, they're technically separate projects. Yeah. And I've seen the, the current planning for the tennis courts expansion, and, and I think it it's, it's looks very doable, and, and uh, so I'm, I'm not, um, not uh, speaking against the tennis court project or anything, but playing the devil's advocate, if that never, sh never happens as envisioned right now, we would have spend extra money to move the playground somewhere else. Um, I mean, it, it, for Yeah, no well, I think what Mr. Fark was saying was we would delay the replacement of the playground until we are certain okay. what's happening with yeah. the tennis okay. court. So essentially that. I was just starting to pick up on that in the yeah. sidebar there. So 476 is a placeholder in 2019? So no, it's in the budget for 2019 as an approved project under the assumption that the tennis court project will go ahead. 
And then it would it, become a whip project? Or? We would whip it, or we would, you know, if we don't spend any money on it, then we would bring it back to council for permission to carry it forward okay. as per the council budget okay. policy. Okay, thanks. Councilor Mara, that was good. You, you had, okay, that was your question. Um, all right, any other questions on those public works projects in, on page 11? We already took out the trail grooming. Yeah, project. that's now been moved to the bottom of the D list. Um, it's a blue Next project there, winter trail grooming equipment, which is on page 12, top of page 12. Um, any other questions on the public works projects, on either that, page 11 or 12? On page 12, the D project, the other D, or one of the other D projects, Quarry Lake Enhancement. Um, and it, it doesn't, it, it notes it's unfunded. Um, but there's a, a complete expectation the Rocky Mountain Heritage Foundation would fund it. We can't say that, but that's the expectation. So we are, yes, yeah, so uh, there is expectation that the foundation will work on a fundraising plan and will look to provide funds to move that forward. And we have it in our work plan to implement that work should those funds come forward. Yeah. And the design work, uh, the design work to date at least has been entirely funded by that, That's the correct. Foundation. So there was a 2018 capital project to right. design the enhancements at Quarry Lake, mm -hmm. which was also funded by the, the foundation. Uh, and that work is currently ongoing. So they've already tendered, they've uh, selected a consultant, the design work has started. Um, and uh, yes. So it's, it's a deep project only <coughs> because how the, um, the funding will be raised by Heritage Foundation is uncertain. That's correct. Yes. Just like the tennis court project. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, do we need to talk about solid services and utilities capital projects? I know we had some very detailed discussion with Mr. Como when he was here. Um, many of them are very technical projects uh, or life cycle projects or both. I'm good. Uh, um, okay, so that's pages 12 and 13, and that finishes our capital budget discussions. Last call, yes, Councillor McCallum. So, at the bottom, we have the reserve funding summaries and all that jazz. This isn't for any one year in particular, this is over the four year and six year. Six year? Okay, thank you very much. That's helpful. Okay, that's great. I love helpful. Okay, so now I would like to move to the motions that uh, would sort of advance the, the budget amendments that we discussed earlier uh, today. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna read them out, uh, committee, and then so in, in that way I'll put them on the floor perhaps, or I can look to whatever. Does that work for you, yeah, Mayor Yeah, you're a member of the committee, so you can okay, make Okay, so um, I'll start with the first one, that the Finance Committee amend the operating budget by adding $100,000 in recre recreation membership revenue in 2019 and 200000 in 2020 through to 2022. I think we had discussion on that. Yep. Those in support? Nobody's opposed? Carried unanimously. Then I'll move that the Finance Committee amend the operating budget by adding 30000 in bylaw fine revenue to each year of the four-year operating budget. Those in support? Any opposed? No. Carried unanimously. Uh, the next one is regarding the reallocation of the annual Fortis franchise fee, so I'll move that the reallocation be done as follows. 330000 in 2019 and 230000 in each year of 2020 through 2024. Uh, and I highlighted that one in case council. I'd like to propose the amendment okay. for the first year from 330 to 430. Okay, so over the break, um, Rick Irwin and I just did take a look at it. it if you add, so it would essentially be um, to make it 4.6%. Yeah, where does it bring us to? So, if I could make just a slight modification then, if, could I withdraw that motion and we address the motion on the uh, positions first? Because then I think that would impact what you might want to draw in, right? It depends on which positions get. 
moved. So Does that make sense? Are you saying that that would affect the positions? Yes, because if, uh, maybe I'll um, move to, uh, where's the, did I, there, option B, sorry. This one, because um, what the 230 and 330 do is um, bring it to the 4.6%, but if we add the $80,000 position, that's when it goes to the 4.9%. So you need to know if that 80,000 position gets approved before your amendment is what I'm thinking. Does okay, that? So if that position gets approved, then it has to be 330, is that what you're saying? Uh, okay. No, if that position gets approved, then the tax increase is 4.9%, and then you might want to put an amendment forward on the 330. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah, People sense. understanding? Yeah, yeah. yeah. sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, we are now then going to jump to motion four. Um, and I'll move that the Finance Committee amend the operating budget by moving the $383,000 in position request from 2021 to 2022 and the 80000 Sorry, to 2020, and the $80,000 position request for the Executive Office of Minister from 2022 to 2019. So that what's in red is not in your package. That's what we discussed this morning and yeah. it seemed like there was support for option B. Yeah. Does it work having that all in one motion? Yeah. Okay, yeah. any discussion on that? We already kind of discussed it. Okay, those in support? Nobody's opposed? Okay, so that's carried unanimously. So now going um, back to then motion three. So before you put the motion on the table, can we see the- The chart? The effect of, of the options that- Yeah, so- there? Um, I'm wondering if you can pull that uh, iterative spreadsheet up, Rick. Structural, does it not? Yes. So, um, so it, if you look at the red above, though, those are all the changes you've just made. Can you make uh, that bigger? Yeah, they don't need to see the bottom as much. Keep going. A little bigger. So bigger. Bigger. <laughs> there we go. That work? Yeah. Okay, so this is what was, I was showing on the slide. So I think um, if you uh, bring in Fortis franchise fees of 330 plus 80 then, um, Rick? Yep. And then that has, so then did you see what that just did? Brought year 2019 to 4.6, but now year 2020 is 4.9. So you'd have to bring that 80,000 in from... Overall, right? So it offsets to the same effect a year later. That's right. Yeah, so it changed the overall two year average. If you bring it in in just one year, if you bring it in in all the years, right. then see, so it, a permanent it would permanent. be a permanent. So 330 would go to um, whatever that is, 410? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, so that means, uh, practically, that means we need to find $80,000 per year in capital to come out. So over six years, um, 40, we have to find another half a million dollars in capital. So this year, go to the big. It's the big one. Yeah. So then that's where we were at. Um, Back to four so the problem is it becomes structural. If you remove it in the, in the first year, that $80,000, you have to remove it every single year, yeah. right? Which means it's not just eighty thousand dollars in one year; it's eighty thousand every year. So again, we multiply it over the six years of the capital window. That's why we need to find five hundred thousand. And the net impact. Uh, four hundred thousand. Yeah. So it's still it's four point nine, four point six. 4. Oh, 4. 40, 40. 40. Oh, Sorry, I was thinking five years. Yeah. Okay. Seeing what the impact will be, I won't propose that amendment. You won't propose that amendment. No. Okay. So then Back to the okay. one you had on the overhead. Uh, okay. Did you want to see the, um, the impact chart on that? Um, so this is... 
Can you make that bigger, please? Yeah. <laughs> you can turn it around. The second youngest member of council can't see it. <laughs> okay, I can read that. <laughs> okay, so this this is where. Uh, Sorry if I can call your your attention. Um, the original slide we had showed you had in the six hundred thousand dollar household, the twenty nineteen impact annually at one hundred and four dollars. This is now showing one hundred and nine dollars. So um, and in the million dollar household, uh, one hundred and fifty nine dollars total impact in the taxes and utility solid waste services. Great, thank you. Clear. Do you want to put that motion number three forward then? Yes. So uh, then the motion three, the finance committee amend the budget by reallocating the Fortis franchise fees as follows, 330,000 in 2019 and 230,000 in 2020 through 2024. Those in support? Uh, carried unanimously. Is that right? Are we already in the final motion? No. No, there's more. Oh, sorry. I skipped two pages. Freudian <laughs> skip. Um, That's funny. Why That's this happening? Funny. It's, it's in the wrong order. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so is this where I'm supposed to be now? <laughs> okay. So the capital changes we discussed, um, the IT budget, Increasing the IT uh, strategic plan by 16,000 and uh, removing the IT disaster recovery plan and business continuity plans, delaying the ladder truck replacement, uh, removing the winter trail grooming equipment, and um, removing, and this is where the, I would like the finance committee to have some discussion yeah. on which one you want to put in there. So the solar separate. project or the... Let's separate out the top four and vote on them, and then okay. separate motion on the. On okay. The uh, Mayor Bowman then moves uh, 5A through D. Are we ready to vote on that? Is everybody cool with them being consolidated? Okay, I'm cool with it, but I just thought I'd ask other people's. Okay. Those in support, 5A through D. Carried unanimously. Uh, and then would it, uh, somebody on the committee like to make a motion for E? Yes, Mayor Bowen? I'll, I'll move that we remove the facility department cooling system upgrade at the roundhouse from the capital plan for budget savings of 156000 And just to speak to that, uh, I, I think it, it's um, more important that we become aggressive and intentional at trying to meet our GHG reduction targets. And, and that will do that by putting solar on that building. Uh, the cooling system, I, I understand, is, is a really uh, important need for the occupants of the building, and it possibly there's other ways of moving forward with that. But if we're going to choose one to the other, my preference, my preference is the uh, is to uh, move forward first with the solar installation project. Can I add to that, Your Worship? Hmm? Can I speak in support of that as well? Yep, absolutely. Um, so I would totally support that choice over the other. And uh, in addition to what you just articulated, I would state that uh, the savings that the um, uh, preschool daycare would uh, enjoy as a result of that could potentially be used towards um, helping to fund um, mm -hmm. the cooling system going into the future. Um, and uh, it will also help them save on their power bills as well, which I know is probably one of their larger expenses yeah, excellent on point. their budget. Mm -hmm. So it definitely, if we have to choose this, not that, this is a good one to choose in my opinion. Any other discussion on that motion? Call the question, those in support? Carried unanimously. <coughs> okay, now which way do I get, nope, this way. Um, so there's a few other, I, I'm going to call them tidy up motions, uh, because we've discussed these through our various presentations, um, but we never, I, I, we generally thought we had support from <coughs> the finance committee, but we, we thought just for complete transparency and, and, um, 
uh, efficiency, we would get the Finance Committee to make these motions. So the first is that the Finance Committee directed Min to reallocate funding for the sustainability quarter from the Planning and Development Department to the Public Works Admin Department. And there's no budget or tax impact, it's just it'll show up differently in your final approved budget uh, once you see it. And, and Lori Rizling, we will have a longer commute to work, just so you know. <laughs> She will yes. move to the Public Works building. She'll ride her bike, though. She will ride her bike, so. yeah. Or take transit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, those in support? I'll move the question, yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, carried unanimously. The second one, and these, um, uh, Sally Cottle spoke to both of them. Um, they're regarding parent link and the ability for us to address salary wages and benefits um, they don't those employees don't receive cola unless they receive grants uh, we was it just last week we got the letter from um, the government saying that we're going to get a one-time grant of seven thousand eight hundred and oh it's an annual increase okay sorry an annual increase which allows us i guess to add it to increase the salary wages and benefits. So, amend the Parent Link Department's budget by increasing revenue from grants by $7,807 and increasing the salary wages and benefits by the same amount. Uh, yeah, Councillor Comfort and then Councillor McCallum. I just wanted to know if that, um, so that 7807 is coming annually from now on, is it continuing grants? Yes. And um, please remind me, does that get us closer to a living wage? We're still underneath livability, I think. Yeah, so we have two staff who are mm -hmm. under, and th this will get us um, at the 2017 living wage rate for those two staff. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor McKellen? That was my question. In addition, so that would be permanent, though, not just in 2019. That would be on going, motion, ongoing. Motion number two, that will be permanent. That is not a lump sum. That is a permanent top-up to their salary that will carry forward every year. And understanding it still doesn't put them within the range, but it still allows us to state that we're Correct. paying them living wage. Thank you. Okay, and then the final motion uh, regarding Parent Link again, and this was where we were uh, discussing the $3,300 rent that the Parent Link Department has to rent for office space over in the Seniors Building. That's now been, uh, that's going to be absorbed by the Facilities Department budget, or uh, so that leaves $3,300 in contracted services, and we would like to have the authority to move that into salary wages and benefits. Um, any discussion on that or uh, questions of clarification? Seeing none, I'll move the question. Those in support, uh, carried unanimously. Okay, so now we can go to our final motion just before the 1 p.m. buzzer. Um, so we've made a whole whack of decisions today. Uh, to reiterate what Mayor Borman said a few times, um, there is the opportunity as council, when you sit and you're actually seeing the budget in its fully amended form, to make final tweaks. But we do need a motion from the Finance Committee to take a final budget to, uh, to council. So this motion will allow us to do that. Finance Committee direct administration to prepare all approved amendments to the four-year operating and six-year capital budgets for final consideration and approval by council on December 18th, 2018. Any questions or comments on that motion? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in support? Carried unanimously. So then I have one final motion, is that we cancel the December 4th meeting of the Finance Committee. Those in support? Okay. You betcha. Uh, we will move to cancel that meeting, and we will prepare all of these amendments and a final budget package and bring that to you on December 18th. Thank you. Uh, I'll move that the Finance Committee be adjourned. Just before we oh. do, uh, just kudos to Admin for the, all carrying the, carrying the weight, doing the heavy lifting to get us here. Uh, it, it has been a complicated budget to consider, and uh, I appreciate the work that Admin did in the months leading up to Finance Committee actually getting a, a look at it. Um, once again, I'm, I'm happily awed by the, uh, the relationship between council and admin and the strong trust that council continues to show for the work that administration is doing. So thank you for that. And thank you. And also want to thank council for putting in a lot of hours to understand the budget and consider it down to the 
the finest detail and uh, and to, to get the process to this point where it can go to council for a decision. Good on everybody. Great. All right, I'll move that the finance committee meeting be adjourned. Those in support? Carried unanimously. Thank you.